Hello and good evening. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Tap India. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Tap India is, we are a collective of galleries. We uh, are a one-stop shop for art uh, coming out of India. We've had a series of talks. They call Tap Talks, and uh, we've had several very interesting talks. And you're here today because of one of the talks. So Tap India was started as a COVID baby uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, we've, uh, we have each gallery with their own uh, personal pages and their own personal collections that are changed every month or every six weeks. And we have a showcase, which has some curated shows. We have an event section where you can be updated on our events. And uh, you can, uh, you'll very soon see the institutions and uh, they will be the institutional members who will show what they have in terms of their exhibitions and objects of the month or artists of the month. So uh, as we grow, we are adding different sections to it. So please stay tuned in. And if you want to be on our mailing list, you can subscribe on our website. It's theartplatformindia.com. So today our talk is about patronage. We have a series of two talks today and tomorrow. Today is primarily about patronage and tomorrow will be about curation and how patronage and curation have gone hand in hand and uh, have made a big, huge dent in the South Asian art world where they have produced this combination of patronage and curation has produced some fabulous artists. So we have two very, very lovely ladies, both extremely accomplished today with us and who you will be listening to. So today's talk, um, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our primary speaker who is France Marquette. She is the main trustee of the South Asia Foundation. The South Asia Foundation was started by Madan Jeet Singh who was the goodwill ambassador to uh, UNESCO. He wanted to be an artist, Francis told me so. And so his, his uh, uh, love for the arts resulted in a lot of art programs for the South Asia Foundation, which is um, aligned to UNESCO. And they've been doing a lot of programs that you're going to hear about what South Asia Foundation does and how they have supported the arts. Uh, uh, France will be in conversation with Salima Hashmi, who I'm sure a lot of you already know. Uh, Salima started the Bacon House National University and has made a world of change to the thinking. She's a very important curator. She, you're going to know more about her tomorrow as well. Uh, she's uh, because of the way she conceptualized ideas and the way she thought things out, she's made an entire, entire generation of, of artists think differently. And uh, because of what she has done with the South Asia Foundation, they were able to start off in a very, uh, very strong way. And they produced a lot of fabulous artists. I'm not going to say more because both the ladies are here to talk. So over to both of you and thank you. First, let me say thank you for being with us. It's lovely to have both of you. Uh, both ladies are good friends and we are so lucky to have you. Uh, so over to you all. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, I think for you. And uh, you know, uh, when you have to fill up the form at the airports, they ask you employment. And I always write housewife because they never retired. <laughs> but today we are going to uh, talk about patronage in art. Uh, why now and why in South Asia? So patronage uh, in art has been there for times immemorial. I mean, during the Egypt, in Egypt during the pharaohs, uh, it, it was a religious based um, patronage. Now you have the Medici in Italy, which was private patronage. In any case, let's go back to South Asia. So how it started? Well, 
it started with the trauma triggered by the partition of the subcontinent in 1947. But that time, a young man by the name of Madanjit Singh escaped from Lahore, where he was studying at the government college. He was saved by a Tongawala, Muslim Tongawala. That vision of the riots haunted him until his last breath. And all his life, he wanted to act in favor of the promotion of tolerance and nonviolence in South Asia. But let's see about his family. So let's start with his father. He was an engineer who had studied in England, went back to India, where he was, he worked as a professor at the uh, Banaras Hindu University. And then he was invited by the Maharaja of Travancore in South India to build a porcelain factory in Kundara. So Madanjit has been brought up in the Punjabi culture. He was born in Lahore, 16 April, 1924, but became immersed in South Asian culture. He would say it was a cultural shock. He was deeply impressed by the way highly skilled and educated women were treated. It sharply differed from the macho culture rampant in the North. But very quickly, he went back to Banares in the university to pursue his studies because he was unable to get used to the South Indian spicy food. So it was while he was in Banares that he followed the Quit India Movement and was in prison in Mirzapur jail. After a year, he was externed from UP, the United Provinces, and went back to Lahore. Thanks to his grandfather, he was able to continue his studies at the government college. He was a keen photographer. He was keen on photography. During the partition, he has staged several exhibitions in Lahore in April 1944 in the Lahore Museum and in Delhi in November 1944. He worked in refugee camps in Delhi. And in February 1949, he organized another exhibition, this time in a gallery that Prime Minister Nehru visited. Then Madanji created a book that contained a series of photographs that he called This My People and asked Pandit Nehru to write an introduction, which he did. This new activity gave Madanji the opportunity to accompany Panditji on his tour to Ladakh as a photographer. During the trip, Panditji asked Madanji, then a chemistry graduate, what would you like to do in the future? Madan Jit replied, I would like to go and continue my studies abroad. Pandiji asked, where? In England? No, Madan Jit replied. So Pandiji advised him to go and meet the director of education who was Prem Kripal, because an exchange of three Indian students and three Italian students was set up. He was one of them with Keshav Malek and his sister Jamila Verghis. So this is how he ended up in Florence to learn the language and then Rome where he worked for the restoration of the Etruscan fresco thanks to his master degree in chemistry. However, he wanted to become a painter. He managed to work in an artist studio, the Amarbuta, the place by excellence for artists until today. Then worked for the Italian national radio, Rai, giving the news in Hindi. And he wrote in a magazine called East and West, published by Ismeo Instituto Studio per el Mediterraneo e Oriente. And ultimately in 1953, he joined the Indian embassy in Rome as a cultural attaché. He was able to bring for the first time Indian artists to the Venice Biennale 
inaugurated by Luther Evans, the UNESCO Director General at that time. Among the artists, there was painting from Amrita Sherville and the young painters of the Bombay School, like Raza Hussein and others. At the same time, in 1954, he was asked to sketch a piece to be blown in Murano with other contemporary and renowned artists like Picasso, Kokoschka, Brad, Moore. The works were exhibited in Rome at the Palazzo delle Esposizioni and then auctioned. He won a very good price for his creation. <laughs> it was during these Italian days that he formed bonds with UNESCO and he published more than a dozen books. He saw the beginning of Europe as a political entity with the signature of the Rome Treaty. He thought that in the future, Sark could become the same. But he became, he came back to painting in Sweden, where he was posted at the beginning of his uh, India Foreign Service. He was inspired by nature and people. And you can see his works in the Museum of Modern Art in Stockholm and in private collections like the one of Prince Sigvard Bernadot, who was also an artist and his wife Marianne. They became a lifelong friends. He wrote, I consider painting to be personal matter like praying God. After fulfilling his diplomatic career in the Indian Foreign Service, in 92, he served as UNESCO Director of Culture and became advisor to successive general directors. In 1995, after his long life devotion to the cause of communal harmony and peace, the UNESCO Executive Board unanimously created the biannual UNESCO Madanjit Singh Prize for the promotion of tolerance and nonviolence. We will celebrate in 2022 the 24th prize. He became UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador on 16 November 2000. But coming back in the beginning of the 90s, he sold his house in Delhi to start the Sumitra Foundation dedicated to the indigenous population in the Bastar area, now in the state of Chhattisgarh. Through renewable energy, essentially solar panels, 40 clinics, school in the villages had electricity. He got the idea in Mongolia while representing the director general uh, of UNESCO, Federico Mayor Zaragoza at that time, during the five year Seals Group expedition. You ask me now, but what has all anything to do with patronage and art? Art and generosity has always been present in his old adult life. When serving in 17 countries around the world, sometimes in very different uh, dangerous war torn regions, like when the US left Vietnam, or like when Idi Amin left Uganda, he wrote, creativity becomes even more fulfilling when identified with a cause. Yeah. At the end of the 90s, he borrowed money to help his son who was starting his high tech company with no cash his son and his partner decided to pay back their fathers with shares. Madanjit was lucky enough to sell them at the right time and decided to create the South Asia Foundation. In 2000, we went around to meet the head of states of the SARC countries, explaining the project to set up institutions devoted to different disciplines where students from the region would be able to study and obtain master degrees thanks to the scholarship funded by him. Institutions were created in different universities, public and private across the region. This is how the UNESCO Madanjit Singh Institute for South Asian Art in Lahore came to be, Yumi Sar. 
Thanks to the efforts and friendship of Professor Salima Hashmi, daughter of Faiz Ahmed Faiz, who recited his last poem coming from exile in Lebanon in Madanjit's flight in Paris, from where I'm talking today. Madanjit's passion for art, freedom and tolerance brought him to choose generosity instead of self-gratification. Through his foundation, are able to pursue his dream and legacy. We are seven trustees, all volunteers, presided by N. Ram from India, Saida Hamid from India, Salima Hashmi from Pakistan, Dr. Kamal Hussein from Bangladesh, Dr. Amin Dobler from Austria, Dr. Nishal Pandey from Nepal, and myself. The eight chapters of South Asia Foundation are headed by a chairperson and an advisory board, all volunteers too. Started in 2002 in Bolius, Maine. Today, eight years after his death, we are able to provide the necessary funds for the continuation of the programs that were set up during his lifetime 20 years ago. We are proud to have helped more than a thousand youngsters, girls and boys in the region to achieve their dream for a new life. Madanji died in Beaulieu-sur-Mer on January 6, 2013. Unlike most foundation, Madanji Singh Foundation does not rely on industry revenues, but on the generosity of a man who has left his entire fortune for an idea. The institutions were built, but he gave half a million to each of them to build up their institute. So in Afghanistan, there was there is the UNESCO Madanjit Singh Center for the Preservation of Afghanistan Cultural Heritage. In Bangladesh, the UNESCO Madanjit Singh South Asian Institute of Advanced Legal and Human Rights Studies. In Bhutan the UNESCO Madanjit Singh Center for South Asian Forestry Studies. In India, the UNESCO Madanjit Singh Center for South Asian Journalism. The UNESCO Madanjit Singh Institute for South Asian Cooperation. And the Madanjit, UNESCO Madanjit Singh School of Green Energy Technology. In Nepal, the UNESCO Madanjit Singh Center for Development Studies and Regional Cooperation. In Pakistan, the UNESCO Madanjit Singh Institute for South Asian Art, which started in 2003, and where 190 students from the region graduated from the institution. 83 females and 107 males. How it works? The MSF send the allowance yearly to the chapters. The chapters are responsible to disperse the money to the institution. They are also responsible to send candidates to other institutions. The welfare of students is our common concern. But let me finish by reading his, la his letter to his friend, the Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh. Personal. Dear Dr. Sahib, I have respectfully declined to accept a Padma Award so kindly offered to me by the government for the following reasons. I believe that there is no higher honor than the Tamara Patra, awarded to me as a freedom fighter against colonial rule by the former Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. I am on the view that the deigning generation of freedom fighters should not be compared with the Padma Award holders, however eminent they might be. My lifetime contribution to Indian arts and culture through several books, exhibition, and by oral means is well known in India as well as internationally. That is a reward in itself. A conviction 
that I have carried since the early 50s when UNESCO published my first book on Ajanta Caves with an introduction by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. At that time, I produced, along with Claude Renoir, an award-winning documentary describing a Jakarta story in which a Buddhist monk, when asked how for six centuries had he and his ancestors been rewarded for painting, Ajanta Caves, he pointed at the masterpieces and stated, that is the reward. This provoked a loud applause among the people watching the documentary in the cinema only in Rome. Words which I never forgotten. Warm regard, your sincerely, Madanji. Beaulieu sur mer, 22nd January, 2007. Thank you very much. Now we can go to other pictures and questions. Yes. Please, the next picture, number two. Yes. Ah, so this is. <laughs> There we are. <laughs> this is, is a meeting. <laughs> this was in Monaco, right? Yeah, this is a meeting, our first meeting in Monaco with Madanjit, of course. <laughs> and all were represented there. Dr. <laughs> Nishal Pande <laughs> from Nepal. I, I, think, I think it's a very good thing to remember Madanjit's yeah. sense of humor. Ah, yes. And his hospitality. The two things yes. went together. <laughs> And uh, he would make us laugh uh, while we were discussing the most serious of matters. <laughs> so that is something that, you know, we, um, we always associate with the fact that his objectives were so strong, so clear, but always delivered in this extremely casual manner. Absolutely. Sometimes Absolutely. too casual, you know. <laughs> so, so that's the first picture that we have of the beginning of it all. If you yeah. like. And we can see also um, uh, Sharon in the back. Yes, Sharon is very and, much there. Yeah, with the Bhutanese and the Sri Lankan next, and uh, Mr. Shweb Hashmi. Yes, my husband. <laughs> yes. Always being told not to smoke. By ah. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember this. It was a lovely, yeah. lovely time. <laughs> yeah. So, next uh, picture, please. Next photograph. Aha, uh -huh. this is the first um, get together of the students in BNU, yes. UMISA. Yeah. That you have all the nationalities. Yes, uh, all of them are here. Afghanistan to uh, Sri Lanka, going through Bhutan, going through Maldives, uh, Maldives. Maldives. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Bangladesh and Bhutan and uh, all the all the eight countries. Yes, and Afghanistan and the Pakistani. And this was when we still did not have a new uh, custom made campus. So this was the first campus that we had, which was in the city, and it was makeshift. Uh, but um, Madanjit and France came, and it was it was wonderful because this was the first group that had come, the first batch. Yeah. And when I look at them now, I mean, some of them have become such eminent artists. I mean, on Absolutely. the right, we have uh, Aisha. Later on, we'll see another picture of her much later. But yes. here, yes. here yes. she is, you know, a very uh, young. She Aisha. is uh, the, the first in the uh, right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Aisha right in the white jacket. Yeah. And, and right I across, know. right across in the black clothes is Raju from Nepal. He is uh -huh. now done his PhD. Um, in Berlin, so you know you have the full range in this um, uh, in this photograph. <laughs> and we can have the next one, maybe. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. And this is the same Ayesha twenty years after. Yeah. And the Art Basel, which is well, you know, Madame Salima. She, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the first and Sharon is very much the contemporary. Um, art fair in the world yeah and um, she was also named the most promising emerging artist at mm -hmm. um, haka art summit some yes. years ago which was you know for uh, across uh, asia so that was a real um, uh, recognition of her talent and she continues to be very prolific she's handled by galleries you know both in india uh, she shows regularly 
um, across the world in biennales and triennales. And uh, so this is the first batch. It yeah. just supposed to show how well we started. Yeah, but I mean, you, you will talk tomorrow and maybe now also, yeah. because there's a lot of artists uh, who are spread all over the world now. Yes. And now the last, the last image, please, the last photograph. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, those are the Afghan artists who were invited uh, to the museum uh, in Marseille. Uh, very nice new museum they have, and uh, they ask uh, some Afghan artists. And among the five, we have three people from um, Yumisa. Uh, so there was Kubra, there was Koshal, and there was uh, Amal, I think, no? the names. Uh, and it was a, a success. It was there for more than one month. But all these artists also are now internationally uh, known and they are exhibiting uh, everywhere. I mean, in, in Spain, in uh, uh, all over Europe. I mean, when I can go, I go and see them. But yeah. unfortunately, because of the COVID, we were a little yeah. <laughs> <laughs> constrained to the house. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, Professor Salima will be able to tell you more about that. Sure. I think that uh, what has been remarkable about this long journey, which started with um, Madanji being rescued, his life being saved um, by a Tongawala in Lahore, who took him to safety during the riots, I think it ignited in him this belief in humanism. And also when he looked at his, um, his region, the South Asian region, I think it hurt him deeply that this region in which everything is shared, history and everything, that they have very little opportunity to actually behave like a region. Like each country seems to have some problem or the other with other countries. It's not just in Pakistan and India, but somehow constantly there's a border problem. There are nobody's talking to this person or that person. And I think Madanjit's vision was that it is perhaps the young people into whom you have to place your confidence um, because they don't carry that baggage of history. And they carry, in fact, you know, they're looking to the future, and especially if they're creative people. I mean, this happens in all the other institutions he's funded also. But I think because art was so close to him, his patronage towards the arts was something which was so significant. And then he could see the outcome. Um, I think that is something wonderful that he was able to see in his lifetime. Exactly. You know? that we see that the artists were doing well, they were working together, and therefore uh, his being a patron in the real sense of the word, which was generosity, but also with a, a patron with an objective, you know, that was, was something that was unusual um, because patrons are very often very selfish and they are, <laughs> they are collecting stuff you know, to give to their uh, children and to uh, sometimes to institutions, yes. Um, but very often it is to do with self. And with Madanji, it was just the opposite. It was to give away, his patronage was giving away um, wealth, but I think um, gaining something uh, quite, quite significant, which we, we see today. Um, France, you had some interesting encounters with some of these graduates from BNU in different parts of the world. Exactly, you? exactly. And, and the, the, the most, I mean, the thing, the most interesting thing for me was that, you know, it is, of, of course, they went and they studied in a magnificent place with uh, teachers, uh, extraordinary teachers, and of course, you were there like their mother, but they really understood why they were there. 
it is not only for a, a, a master degree or, or just for a, you know a diploma. It was because this um, life they spent together for two, four, six years that made the whole difference in their life. And they understood that. And for us as a foundation, this is what we wanted. This is what manage it wanted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Essentially. But you were you were when you were needed, and there have been some uh, important moments when you were needed. Um, you know when we had a very major problem with uh, taking bringing one artist to safety from Kabul. You know. Yeah. That well, stuff. that that's another that's another problem. But it is because I represent a foundation to UNESCO. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, it's a it's a very important thing. And when I went to see the director at that time, uh, who was dealing with this type of problem, uh, he said, okay, but why us? I said, because she studied at the UNESCO Madanjit Singh Institute in Lahore. Uh, then it is different. I said, yes, it is different. She is part of UNESCO also. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so she was saved. She was smuggled right. into the French embassy and then yeah. the French embassy flew her out to safety. Right. Um, right. And now she has been uh, um, awarded a, like a Padma Shri here in India. <laughs> but, but there's a, 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 an, an award specifically for the artist. Mm -hmm. So she yeah. got it uh, a couple of years ago mm -hmm. by the Minister of Culture here in this country. So she's a very well-known and renowned. She uh, exhibited in all the museums, modern uh, art museum of Paris, the other museum of immigration. Uh, no, she's a, a big shot now. And I think she has been a, become a role model for other artists, yes, exactly. um, both from her country, from Afghanistan, but also other artists who feel, you know, that they they have many many issues of freedom of expression mm -hmm. which is there across south asia but she's become like a symbol of somebody who's able to overcome great yeah. difficulties and yeah. great difficult adversity but still manage to be you know somebody who is carrying on with her practice yeah. and self-expression is an important yeah. thing and thing. helping all the also yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah yeah, so she's giving back. She's giving back, yes. I think that we, there are others who you have met. I remember that Zille, who is in Lahore now, the jewelry designer, she had a show somewhere and you arrived to meet her in South, in South of France somewhere. I remember that. She was so delighted. Yeah. That. And uh, also, um, I remember Zille, when she came, she, she was doing jewelry or something like that. Mm. And uh, I was at UNESCO at that time because there was a forum about women and this and that. So I brought her there also. Mm -hmm. um, well, experiences like this were very, very interesting. I mean, for me <laughs> to see uh, on real life how these uh, youngsters yeah. came out of the box, we should say. Yeah. And, truly, uh, yeah. truly, they have come out of. <clears throat> the most uh, odd of oddest of uh, places yeah. uh, come down um, from a mountain in Bhutan and found yeah. themselves, you know, in, in Lahore, um, come by bus and come by air. And, um, so, you know, that is something that uh, was made possible by this it seemed to be just a dream. Right. To be honest, when we started, we didn't know um, how far it could go. And yeah. I suppose that's what patronage does. Um, patronage reaches out and delivers um, all kinds of uh, unexpected dividends, you can say. You know, that is, yes, that is but, but, but more than that, uh, I think also the fact that uh, uh, we, the trustees, are very close to each other. Mm -hmm. We were able also to continue. Yeah, yeah. It is not, I mean, Madanjit could do it alone because he had the money, he had the checkbook. 
but <laughs> we, 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 we are very close together also, and that's a, a, a very positive uh, outcome. And that's why we are able to continue. Yeah. I, I think that's a reflection again of that vision that South Asians left to themselves without the interference of all kinds of vested interests, they are absolutely quite a natural fit. And they come together with such ease because they share thousands of years of living together, actually. The borders have already always shifted. You know, there have been great empires which took in all parts of this area and then they disappeared and, you know, then the colonizers came and disappeared and then we started, government started arguing among themselves and so on. But some of the people, uh, given a chance, Absolutely. they seem to, to manage. And I think that, uh, so the trustees being from different countries, managing and, you know, absolutely convinced that they will carry on with the mission is something that's happening quite naturally, I think. You know, we haven't had really to, to work with an effort. It just comes, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think that I don't know if there are any, any questions or which way. I, I wanted to ask, is this the only organization that is of this nature? Are there other organizations that you both know of? Um, I, I know of artists' organizations, which are, um, you know, their groups like um, in India, there's Koj and Vassal in, um, in Pakistan who are loosely, and they're, 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 they have them in... You know, they, they are like support organizations, but yes, this is a support real patron. I think what is very different about this particular initiative is that they live together for a long period of time. So it's not like they have come together for a residency or they have come together for three months. They come together and they live and they work and they produce work together for four years or if they come for a master's for two years. And yes, some of them have come for shorter periods of time, but that exposure to one another's cultures, uh, to languages, to beliefs, to faith, uh, that I think is is something that is is different, and I really don't know of another organization uh, which does this for South Asia. I think this is the only one, and I, I feel sorry that it's the only one. There should be more, um, but we hope that this becomes um, a kind of a an example um, because th this is something rare. Um, I remember I was giving a talk, France, in, in London some years ago, which was about Pakistani art. And I somehow talked about the fact that, you know, we started intermingling much more of the Pakistani art with India, with Bangladesh, and so on, and artists know one another. So somebody just said that, you know, uh, you're, you're very optimistic and idealistic, and surely this is a difficult thing. And somebody in the audience put up their hand and said, I want to answer that. So I was quite surprised that who is this? And it was one of our Indian students who had happened to be in London. Um, she studied at Broda and she stood up and she came to the front and she said, I'm an example of somebody who came and studied in Lahore. And I, I can assure you that this kind of an interaction and learning is very, very possible. So I didn't even have to answer that. That was our example, a living example Right. of, of, um, of Madanjit's vision and the opportunity that he gives so many people. Yeah. Actually, um, when we, we started uh, this in, in South Asia, we were invited by the European uh, community to ask her, how uh, are we doing in South Asia? Why well, we say this is how we, we proceed? So now I think there started exchange from university, uh, European university to uh, some, but I don't know how many university and, and, and I don't know in which field actually. 
but this is very uh, in a small small way and they were they're, they're interesting spin-offs like i was in in um, in colombo mm -hmm. and one of our former students uh, he did graphic design with us uh, sri lankan and he's now with hsbc he's he's a chief designer he told me that he had been taking students who had been in the hostel with him uh, not even artists because of course in the university you have many different uh, disciplines that they had come to sri lanka and said show us your country so i he said i had a great time i took them all around the countryside and even places i had not seen i showed them so you know these networks can go yeah. beyond the arts also is they've given so many people the opportunity of really knowing one another very very well yeah. and strange that our students from all of our countries go to the west they go to america to canada to europe they don't although they when they meet up for some different south asia they great friends but it's more that way and south to south there's far less which is a great pity because i think we have a lot to give one another a mm -hmm. uh, lot of understanding a lot of historical sharing so that is something that this very exceptional uh, program has done the foundation has done really so how does one actually take this further and get more and grow this i mean is it more collaborations with universities and uh you know i went with you france to calicut university so yeah. is it more collaborations with universities or how does how do like art students uh, uh, apply to this or how do they get to know about this foundation and how do they actually how do you actually select the people well uh, as you know we have eight chapters there's a chairperson by your person advisory board in their countries they are the one who are going to select the students who are going to be sent to uh, in the case of uh, salima in her institution so among the advisory board there are people who are more uh, um, gifted towards journalism or towards uh, green technology or whatever so and some are you know they are more interested in arts so those people are the one who select the students how by well it was before with the uh, by the newspaper but now it's everything on the on the web so we know that you know uh, professor salima has her inscription uh, on that date so they will put it on the web and now because we have so many students it is most of the time word of mouth among the students themselves you know they say oh but i was there and uh, uh, it is like this like this and uh, this is how it, it comes and then of course the institution is the one who select uh, at the end the students according to their criteria we don't enter in that process we just send in the, the candidates and they decide and normally we try to have gender parity that's that's interesting <laughs> in asia that is important and very important i mean is is not going sometimes we have more in, in some discipline we have more girls than boys yes yes definitely definitely <laughs> we we've been very lucky we've been managed to have um, you know well i think at the end of the day we've had more females than males and uh, that possibly has to do with the fact that there's so much pressure on males to do more important things that are going to you know earn their living but um, i'm happy to say that some of our uh, male students are absolutely Uh, able to earn their living, and uh, you know we hear from them, and they're doing extremely well. So, mm. uh, in today's day and age, um, with working from the net, uh, there is no there's no starving artists who are sitting in garrets all by themselves. 
they're all over the place. No, yes. and I think all the borders have really been erased with, in these last 18 months yes. because I think we've really got unified with this one issue. And I think it's helped us all understand that you can actually work from anywhere and on anything. Yeah. So that's, that's one advantage. And I think so when you look at an organization like the South Asia Foundation, you think how appropriate that at a time like this, you know, you have something that's unifying people, you know, with a reason. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. It has been, um, it's been a learning for everybody, but I think most of all for people who always thought that you had to have a face-to-face -face encounter uh, in our field, uh, it, we have managed to really discover that sometimes it's not all that critical that you can manage, you know, long distance um, and do some very exciting things, long distance also, very exciting collaborations um, that have been happening. So that's, that's always inspiring. But you know, it's the young that lead you. I found that at least. They lead you because they are making these new discoveries. Yes. They are sometimes way ahead of old fogies like us. You know? <laughs> so tell me, have you ever thought of doing small, shorter programs like workshops and things like that? We have a lot of them. There have been quite a few. In fact, now that I've retired as Dean and I'm Professor Emeritus, um, still connected, and I'm still the director of Humus Out, which is just as a scholarship program. Um, last, not this summer, but the summer before, they did something at BNU, which is called the Global Classroom, in which they invited faculty from other places and students from other places. So it was a very exciting summer program. Um, we had students from Singapore, we had students from the US, we had students from Delhi, we had students from Bombay, and they were all attending online. And we had faculty from all, you know. That right? sounds fantastic. So and is it going to become an annual yeah. program? <laughs> yeah, and um, I, I, I did a, call. I did a lecture on um, the history of women artists of Pakistan, and I got such tremendous feedback. Uh, from some of the students. And I remember there was a student from Delhi um, who was very interested and in asking lots of questions. So the global classroom was actually very, very successful for the summer. You know, we had to be, A, had to be in touch, um, keep the faculty involved, get fresh faculty. So we got some very eminent people from different parts of the world to come on as, as summer faculty. Um, so it was a, a very successful experiment. I'm sorry that it was not done this year. I think as the things start opening up, you find that, okay, so it's, the campus comes back to life, you know, in physical form. So you are less inclined to really, um, you know, use the net in the same way that you were using it last year with, with a vengeance. Is it possible to do it again? Because this yes, benefits so many people. I'm sure it can be, and I'll send you a message. In fact, if France, you must give the message to the Dean because you'll be meeting him in the advisory council meeting this week. And so you must um, bring yeah. that up. The global, uh, a global classroom, yeah. Global classroom, yes. yeah. I think that's a great idea because, uh, I mean, I can't think of some anything more interesting because people like us, I mean, even if we are, you know, well past the student age, you can go to these kind of lessons. You It opens your mind up to so many things. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. You know, I went back to uh, studying art history after many years by listening to lectures. I started inviting people to lectures mm -hmm. and it was so interesting. Then we started taking groups of people to the sites mm -hmm. and, it was just amazing because the energy is different when you know you see different people from different parts of the country. For us, it's different parts of the country. And if you see them from different parts of the world and you are interacting with eminent scholars and teachers, it's it's such a great learning. So I think you should look at I think you should look at this thing of not only students, but the older, you know, older <laughs> generations like us. <laughs> 
you know, the, th the good thing in Global Classroom was that actually we had quite a variety, we had quite a diversity of people from, you know, different ages, different countries, different backgrounds, uh, most of them involved in the arts, but some of them who just joined, you know, for the heck of it, because they were interested. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was quite diverse and therefore much more exciting. France, I think I'm going to urge you to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave it to France. She's going to crack the whip when she comes. Okay, okay. 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 I, put it down, I put it down in my agenda too. Yes. So, <laughs> I think, so I don't know if we have any questions. We are chatting, but uh, I'm looking at the chat box. Uh, well, it's we, we have some comments where people say it's very refreshing. So, um, uh, I don't know if there's anything else we need to touch on. So maybe I should tell people about tomorrow. We're just coming up to the end of the hour. So uh, I think we should tell people tomorrow, the talk is with uh, Professor Salima Hashmi, where Salima is going to talk about curation and how she actually made this huge difference to, uh, to, the, to this entire generation of people and how everybody's thinking changed. So I think we're going to look forward to this. We have one question from somebody just yeah. now. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, add one thing on the selection of the students. So yeah. I think somebody wants to know how you select the students. No, 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 no. It, 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 can, you, can you give the floor to him? Mr. Nishal Pandey is, is one of your invitees. OK. Uh, Anya, can we do that? Mm. Can we can we give him a share? Ah, yes, I can I can make him. Yeah, just to thank you, yes. just just to add a, a little bit of point. What an interesting, refreshing uh, conversation. But on the selection of students, uh, we in SAF Nepal have a very prominent, accomplished artist, uh, Mrs. Ashwina Ranjit, who does the selection of the students, and she has her own art uh, council. Uh, which has uh, members who do the selection of the students. And uh, now it has become so large and um, so successful that the alumni themselves are, you know, involved in the dissemination of information about the scholarships in Lahore. So I just wanted to add that, but it has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. And it's nice to see you after so many years. Yes, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you all for being here with us this evening. And we look forward to everybody joining us again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And uh, so tomorrow I will send out the links again. And if somebody needs, we are uh, our link is also available. You can register at the art platform uh, india.com and where we have uh, where we have the event listed there. And uh, so thank you, thank you, Franz. Thank you, Salima. Thank you, thank you. It was lovely. It was such a lovely, lovely. Wonderful. You're getting a lot of lot of comments on on it being a lovely conversation. So thank, thank you all. You. Thank, thank you. you. And see you all soon.